All right, let's get started. So if you're already, if you're still arriving, then welcome, come on in, there's plenty of room. Um, so hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Seaman. If you want to know more about me, there's an about page there on blog.pleur.dk. So I'm not going to, you know, tire you with all the details. I'm also at Twitter at Pleur, and I, you know, I love tweets, particularly if they're, you know, positive. Um, but uh, but still, okay. So this talk is called One One Carter Three Languages. So I'm going to do a software Carter, a little exercise. I'm going to do some live uh, coding while I do that. Um, and I'm going to do it in three languages. And th those languages will be C Sharp and, uh, and, and Haskell and, and Clojure. So if you've never seen Haskell or Clojure before, you're in the right place, because that's basically the idea about this talk, to say, well, if you're curious about those languages, you've never seen them before, but let, you know, want to know what they look like, and maybe also what they're about, then uh, this talk should give you just a, you know, a brief introduction to those languages. Obviously, you're not going to be an expert or, or really understand much, but at least you've seen them, and then you can go and, uh, and look into it yourself if you think that's interesting. So that's, that's basically the idea here. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about Carters. How many of you do Carters regularly? Maybe not every day, but just you know, once in a while. No? Not a, not a lot? A couple? All right. Um, I, I, think, I think you should do Carters. You, I think you should do, consider doing Carters. So the concept of a Carter actually comes from martial arts, so that's why this uh, karate guy is there. And I believe the word is Japanese and means something like form. But basically the idea is that um, sometimes you want to train, but you don't have a you know, sparring partner, and uh, you still like to train. So you can, do, you can go through some motions, and that should build up muscle memory, which is important when you're doing a physical activity to actually have you know, your body accustomed to making certain moves. Um, so that's a pretty good way of, of doing something that is um, you know, exercising with, when it's a physical activity. Now, Sometimes when you do programming, you'd also like to train. If you want to become a better programmer, uh, it might actually be a good idea to, to train. But, um, but the problem with, uh, you know, we don't really need to, to build up muscle memory. You know, contrary to some people's belief, it's not, the, the, it's not the, your typing speed that you know, determines whether or not you're a good programmer. Uh, it's more like what, what really makes you a good programmer is experience and your ability to think things through. And, um, and the, more thing, the more you are accustomed to thinking and looking at programming problems from different angles, the better you will be at that. So um, in order to train your brain, you, you, don't go, you, you shouldn't go through the same, ex in, you know, the same steps all, you know, all the time. What you should do is you, try, you should try to make your brain think about things that you, don't, uh, that you can't think about or you haven't uh, tried to think about before. So you need to you know, do something that is novel to your brain. So it's sort of like the opposite of actually building up muscle memory. You, you need to try to do something that is new. And even if you're a professional software developer, that's actually not what you do on, on your day-to-day -day job. You know, on your day-to-day -day job, you probably do the same thing. You write in the same language that you wrote in you know, last year or maybe last week and so on. And you, you know, you're working on the same code base. You're using the same methodology. You're probably you know, working with the same colleagues. And it might be nice. You know, it's, it might be a very good job that you have. But it's not like it's actually giving you, um, you know, challenges and in, in, in force you to think about things in new ways. Uh, so I think it's a good idea to just you know, try to, to do things that you don't know. So that's why I think a, a Kartik is actually a pretty uh, good way of approaching things. So instead of trying to do the same software exercise all over and over and over again, what I really do is I try to do various exercises, but I try to do them you know, in different languages or with different constraints and so on, and I mix them up. So I, I never really do the same thing twice um, unless I give presentations, um, and then I do the same thing twice, but that's work. Um, so, you know, an example of a kata, one of my favorite katas is the tennis kata. Uh, basically, what you have to do here is you have to implement the scoring system for tennis. And I like this one because it's quite simple. It's easy to understand. You can cover the rules in about 20 seconds. Um, and uh, it's not difficult at all to implement, but it does have a few gotchas here and there. So you may be surprised the first time you try to do the cards, and you'll discover that, well, it's pretty simple, but it's not quite as simple as you actually thought. So I, think I like that for that reason. Um, another favorite of mine is, is the diamond carter. But the one that we're going to look at today is the Fizzbus Carter, the simplest of all Carters. This is ridiculously simple and easy to implement. But that also means that the point here today is not so much doing Carter. Uh, the point here today is to introduce you to um, new language that you may not have seen before. Uh, so we're going to talk about you know, the syntax and the philosophy be, you know, behind the language. And that means you know, the problem is not going to you know, stand in the way. And so you, you don't have to think about the problem. This is trivial. I'll cover the rules if you've never heard about it uh, before. I'll only spend like 20 seconds, 30 seconds on it. 
before we do that, you know, I should just tell you, you know, um, there are lots of carters out there. Um, a good place to go is bit.ly slash code carters. It's not all of those carters, but this is just a, a site. Um, it started out as a wiki that someone uh, have, you know, created with a lot of those carters uh, in them. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, right, okay, so we're gonna look at three languages today. So the first language that we're gonna look at is uh, C-sharp. So I'm assuming that you are either a C-sharp developer or a Java developer, or at least someone who is familiar with the, one of those languages enough to be able to read the C-sharp code that I'm showing you. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend too much time actually on the C-sharp code. I'm not gonna do live demoing of the C-sharp code because that's not really the point. The, the, the reason why I want to show you the C-sharp code is just to, so that we have something to contrast to or compare to. Um, but the first language that I'm actually going to show you then is Haskell. And uh, I'm going to talk about what Haskell is when we get there. And then when, I, when I'm done doing Haskell, I'll do the same Carter again for a third time in Clojure. And the first thing we can you know, identify here when we are looking at this slide is that we can see all cool languages have nice logos. And uh, what does that say about C-sharp then? Um, I don't know. You know, F-sharp has a nice logo. Haha. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's basically it. So, um, okay, so let's just cover the rules of FISBUS. So um, the rules of FISBUS is very, very simple. You should write a program that prints the numbers from one to 100, but there are some special rules because if the number is a multiple of three, you should print FIS instead of the number. If it's a multiple of five, it should, you should print BUS. And if the number is a multiple of both three and five, you should print FISBUS. That's it. So as, it, as I promised, you know, we can spend all of 20 seconds talking about the rules of FISBUS, and that's basically it. So it's trivial, you know, it's not an interesting problem at all. If you, um, if you try to do this in the language you're most familiar with, you should be able to do this in like five minutes. Um, so, but that also means that we, you know, you shouldn't be confused of, okay, what was the rules about FISBUS and how do we actually do this? This is really, really trivial. So that enables us to fo just, just focus on the language instead of focus on the problem. Now, just, let's just look at, you know, what could it look like in C-sharp. So, there, you know, C-sharp is one of those languages where there's not one way of doing things. There are plenty of, of alternative ways to approach a problem. So here's just a sort of an old-fashioned implementation of, of FISBUS in, in C-sharp. So, you know, since you want to have a, a program, you need to start with a main method. So that's fairly um, standard. And what you could do is, if you want to do it really the old-fashioned imperative way, you can say, well, let's have a for loop, and you'll just go from the numbers from 1 to 100. And the first thing you do is you say, well, if i modulo 3 times 5, five equals 0, you'll print, or you'll uh, console.write line fisbus. And the only thing you might wonder here is, so why do I do 3 times 5 and not just 15, which, you know, 3 times 5 obviously is. And the reason for that is basically just, you know, I, I, I like the philosophy of domain-driven design um, where you talk in the domain language. So even when I do carters, I like to do my carters in, um, in the language of the, the carter description. And the carter description of FISBUS, you know, specifically talk, talks about the numbers 3 and 5, but it never talks about the number 15. Um, so I just thought that, you know, I, I'm happy to use the constants 3 and 5 because they're part of the domain language, if you will, but the number 15 is not. So that's basically why I did that. It might be even clearer and more, you know, relatable to the rules if I had written something like if i modulo 3 equals 0 and i modulo 5 equals 0, then, you know, print this bus, whatever. We can do that later on. All right, otherwise I'll say, well, if it's module five equals zero, I'll print bus, and then, you know, module three equals zero, I'll print fist, and then otherwise I'll just print the number. So that's basically it. You know, if I run this uh, program, it's just gonna start printing out all of those, those numbers. So I just, you know, wrapped that column into multiple col columns here in order to fit all the numbers on the screen, but obviously it's just gonna, you know, print uh, one column. So that's basically what, what it is that we want to achieve. So that was the C-sharp part of it, uh, C-sharp part of it. Now, let's, uh, let's look at it in Haskell then. So first of all, before I just start typing some Haskell code, let's talk a little bit about, okay, what is Haskell actually? So first of all, we re realize that Haskell has a cool logo. So there's also a version of that logo in colors, it making it even more cool, but you know, for some reason I decided to pick the gray one. Um, the next thing we can say about Haskell is that it's a strictly functional uh, programming language. So what do we mean by strictly functional? Well, it turns out that a lot of the popular functional programming languages out there, like Scala and Clojure and F-sharp, um, possibly also Erlang, which I don't know a lot about, 
Um, but the other ones that I just mentioned here, they are not actually strictly functional. They are like what we could call multi-paradigmatic languages, uh, particularly Scala is, and also F-sharp is pretty multi-paradigmatic. You can do object-oriented uh, you know, software development in F-sharp if you want to, because F-sharp needs to interoperate with all the C-sharp code and the Visual Basic code that's already on .NET. And this so same sort of situation also goes for the other languages there. So they are not strictly functional. They're sort of like designed to make functional programming easy, but they can do sorts of, all sorts of you know, imperative stuff and things with side effects as well if you want to. Now, this is not true for, for Haskell. Haskell is, Haskell is a strictly functional language. There is the Haskell way or or the highway when, you, when you're writing Haskell. You can't just say, well, yeah, but I'd like a little bit of state mutation here because uh, whatever. Nope, it's not possible. You have to write functional code. That's the only thing you can do. So it's a great l language for learning pr functional programming if you're interested in this because you can only do functional programming with it. Um, the other thing we can say about Haskell is that it's statically typed. And actually, what we're looking at at the moment, this bullet list is actually, if we could call that a bullet list, this is actually Haskell code. This compiles and it has a type. Haskell is a value, Haskell up here on the slide. Um, the value has the type, it's a list of strings. In this case, it's probably fairly evident that, that what is going on because the um, square brackets there indicates that it's a list. And since the you know, values inside of the list are quoted with the, those quotes, double quotes, those are strings, so therefore this is a list of strings. Um, but you'll notice that there is actually no type declaration anywhere, but even so, it is statically typed because the compiler can f infer you know, the type of this list. You know, a third, third thing we could say about Haskell is that it's lazily evaluated, which is sort of uh, unusual. That's not what we're used to when we do C Sharp or Java development. But it's not something that we actually need to think much about when, you know, when I show you the, the cards are here. So let's, let's not talk too much about that. So with that said, let's try to see what it looks like to, um, to do the FISBUS Carter in, in Haskell. So in order to do that, I'll switch to uh, here's Atom. And uh, it'd, be, it'd be not interesting to show you Hello World, so I already put that in here. But that's basically what Hello World looks like. And if I want to evaluate it, I can switch here to, um, to, a, um, to my console here. I have loaded the Haskell REPL, the read eval print loop. And if you can't see the font size, now, now is the time to actually speak up to ask me to, to change it, because that's better you know, if you do that straight away. But I tried to see if I could make the font size big enough. So I can call the main function here, and you see that it prints out hello world. So yeah, it works at this point. But that's not what we want to do. We want to do FISBUS. So I'll switch back to my editor here, and I'll say, well, OK, so I'll, I, want to de de um, I want to deconstruct the problem into two problems. I want to take. First of all, I want to solve the problem of having a single number and figure out, figuring out for that number what should the resulting string be. And then once I have that function, I can then start to figure out, OK, um, if I have a list of numbers or you know, a sequence of numbers, then you know, how do I actually print out all of those, those uh, strings instead? So I'm going to write first a function called fizzbuzz1. And I, I'm calling it 1 because it just deals with one input element. And you don't have function overloading. In, um, in, in Haskell, so you need to call this function some, something else. And I want to reserve the, the word fizzbuzz for the function that actually does you know, uh, for all the numbers. So the fizzbuzz1 function needs to take an input. And we can just call that i, uh, i for integer. We could also have called it number. But you know, in, ha in Haskell, we like to keep things very succinct so that it's as unreadable as possible. Um, so the first thing we need to figure out is uh, how do we actually convert a number to a string? And uh, that turns out to be fairly easy because there is a, n there is a function called show that will convert a, you know, a lot of different things into integers. So if I try to compile this, uh, you will notice that the, all sorts of warnings pops, uh, pop up over here. Some of the warnings you, you shouldn't really worry about because one of the warnings, for example, is that it says, well, this function is not used. Um, and I, I will use it, but only until the end of the carter. So you will, you will see at least that warning until the very end. So don't worry too much about those things. Um, there's a couple of other warnings that we can talk about. But actually, basically, this already compiles and is statically typed, believe it or not. So if I go back here and reload my, my, um, my, my code, I can say, well, all right, let's call fizzbuzz1 with the number 1, for example. And you'll see it prints out or it returns the string 1. And if I do it with 2, you know, it you know, returns the string 2. And you know, if I do it with 3, it returns the string 3, which is not the correct implementation, but shouldn't really surprise us, because we haven't started dealing with that. But that ought to be fizz, right? 
OK, so I, I told you that this is statically typed. So we can ask, you know, in the REPL here, we can say, what is the type of FISBUS1? Well, the compiler says, well, the type of FISBUS1 is this. It's, this looks a little bit uh, weird, but it says, show a fat arrow, a small arrow string. So basically, what it means is, what I usually do is I say, well, first of all, I focus on everything that's on the right-hand side of that fat arrow. Um, so I'm just looking a, a thin arrow to string. So basically what that means is that it's a function that takes a value of the type A and returns a string. Now, string is probably pretty understandable for, for everyone that has done any software development uh, ever. Um, but what is A? Well, A is a generic type. So you know generic um, you know, methods from C Sharp and Java has generics as well. And that's basically what we have here. So this could be any any, well, not actually any value, but it could be a value of a lot of different types. And I'll just prove it to you to say, well, okay, instead of calling it with, with, the, with integers, you know, I can call it with a decimal, and that's gonna, you know, work just fine. You know, I can call it with a Boolean, so if I call it with the Boolean value false, it's just gonna give me the, the string false back. You know, if I, I can even call it with another string, so I can say, well, foo, it's just gonna double code it. That's a little bit weird, but that, uh, you know, uh, you'd expect it to just return the string and, again, you know, without actually double coded it, but that's some, you know, whatever. Um, so it just takes everything, uh, well, actually not everything, but it takes a lot of things and just turns them into strings. So what does this show A thing mean? This, so let's just type out the, um, let's look at the type of FISBUS1 again. So you'll notice that it says show A, fat arrow, and then A. And that, what, what's on the left-hand side of that fat arrow is a qualification of the generic type. So it says, well, it's not every type. It's only those types that belong to what we call a type class called show. So, you know, in, in, um, in C Sharp and in Java, you are, uh, you know, probably used to Every object belongs to a, an object hierarchy that you know, derives from objects, and you know, objects define a two-string method. Not so here in Haskell. There are a lot of things that you can turn into strings. You know, everything that belongs to the type class show you can turn into a, a string. But you shouldn't really take the word type class to mean a class like in, in C Sharp or Java, because it's sort of different. You can think of it as a category of types or a set of types that all can be turned into string. But basically what it means is that if, if a type belongs to the type class show, there is a show function or the show function is defined for that type and that means we can use that type and turn it into a string. All right. So you'll notice also that the compiler tries to infer a type of the function that is as, you know, as universal as possible. So in, in this case, it says, well, it could be anything as long as we can turn it into a string. It's not going to stay that way because we, we need, we'll need to do some ar arithmetic on the, the number in order to figure out whether it's a multiple of three or five. So it's gonna, we ha we'll have to restrict it more on, until we can continue. One of the things that the compiler would like me to do, though, is it, it'd like me to actually you know, put on a a specific type declaration, so we can do that as well. That's one of the warnings. So we can write fisbus one is. Um, uh, so I'm j basically just going to, you know, write what the compiler already inferred. I'll say for every show a, uh, the function is uh, takes a as input and returns a string as output. So that's just one more warning uh, less uh, now. So uh, so we you don't ha you don't have to do this in order to make it to compile, but you know the, the Haskell still would like you to do that because sometimes that is useful. Now, with that out of the way, let's try to figure out, okay, so how do we deal with all the other requirements of having to you know, return fis if it's a multiple of three? So what I can do is I said, well, I can't do overloading, but you know, I can define the function um, in more than one way. So in this case, I can say, well, fis plus one of i, it, I can actually define a constraint or a filtering you know, implementation of that function. So that, what, that, this is what this vertical bar means. It says, well, every, you, what comes next is a Boolean expression. In this case, I'll say, well, you know, i mod three should equal zero. So this is just a funky way of, of writing, um, you know, an infix uh, operation. Uh, let's not worry too much about that. If that is true, now this is a Boolean expression. If that is, if that, if that evaluates to true, we can return you know, fis. So the return value of the function is just the expression after this, uh, you know, single equal sign here. Um, but this is, this particular, you know, Im implementation of the function, if you will, will only be called if this Boolean expression here actually values to true. Otherwise, it's just going to fall uh, down into this, um, you know, default implementation, if you will, that doesn't have any constraints. So this is sort of the fallback implementation. So the order actually matters here. 
Now, if I try to compile this, you'll notice that, you know, that, it, that uh, it doesn't actually compile the, these red boxes around it. And the reason for that is it says, well, mod is not defined for any show. You know, for any generic type argument A that only belongs to the show, show type class, mod is not defined for those types because, you know, this, you know, how do we do mod, mod on a string, for example? That's, we don't really know how to do that. So we need to constrain the type further on and say, well, you know, A must belong to the show type class, but it must also belong to another type class, and that type class is called integral. And I'll, you know, get back to what that means in, in a moment. But basically now it, uh, it compiles. So if I go back to my REPL, I can reload my code and I can say, okay, what is FISBUS 1 or 3? That is now FIS. So I'm happy. That works. Okay, so what does, uh, what, do, what does integral mean? Well, integral is basically just another type class. So that means it's a set of types that, you know, share a contract, if you will. And integral is just any integer. So, um, you know, in, in Haskell, integers might not be, you know, one integer. There's 16-bit integers and 32-bit integers, 64-bit integers, and there are unbounded integers that can be as large as, as you will as long as they're within the constraints of your, of your system. You know, that's true for .NET as well. They have all of those different integers, and Haskell does that as well. But what I've done here, is, you know, in, in .NET, you know, in c I would have had to write an overload for all of those specific integers and, and deal with each of those types specifically, whereas in Haskell, I can just say, well, you know, this just applies to any integer that, uh, that belongs to the set of, of, of uh, integer types that we call integral. Because for all of those types, the mod function is defined. Oh, fine. Um, and there's a, there, you know, the integral type class also defines other functions than mod, it, you know, like plus and minus and, and, and things like that. Um, but now that means, you know, I can go back and, and reload. I already do, did that. I, I was just talking about integral. I sort of you know, explained that already, so let's move on. Um, so I'll just do a copy and paste, and I'll say, okay, if it's you know, modulo 5, I should print buzz, and you know, if it's a modulo of... So I could do what I talked about in, 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 um, in C Sharp. I can say an i mod um, 5 equals 0. Then it should be fist buzz. So again, you know, this looks a little bit verbose. Uh, you may think that, that um, it could be more, you know, does it have to be this verbose? And it doesn't. You know, I'm just showing you, you the more verbose syntax because I think it's a good introduction to the language. But you can actually write it much more compact so you don't have to repeat yourself uh, just uh, as much as I did here. Um, but uh, so there are all sorts of, you know, language syntax shortcuts uh, you can use if, if you don't like, you know, the, the, the verbosity of this. So if, if I reload now, we can see that, um, you know, FISBUS3, we expect that to return FIS. It does. Uh, 5 returns BUS. 15 returns FISBUS. So that seems promising. So the next thing we need to figure out is to say, well, OK, uh, now I have a function that takes a single integer or a single integral and returns a string. But what I actually need is to print the, all the numbers from 1 to 100 using that, you know, algorithm, if you will. So how do I do that? So I need to do a loop. And then you run into this problem that Haskell doesn't do loop. You can't do loops in Haskell. Oh, huh. OK, so what do you do then? Well, Haskell doesn't do loops, but it does lists. So let's look at what a list is. So a list in Haskell is a um, linked list. Maybe I should just um, clear the console here so that we, um, no, that doesn't give me the top then. Hmm. Well, I hope you can see, even though I'm writing down there in the bottom. Um, so. I was talking about lists. So lists in, in Haskell are linked lists, and we can, you know, we can write them out you know, fairly easily, like saying, well, here's a list of, of three numbers, uh, the numbers one, uh, four, and two. Um, but lists are generic as well, so you know, I can also write a list with the, with the strings foo and bar if I wanted to do that. You know, but I can't mix them, so you know, if I try to you know, put in a, an integer into a list of strings, that doesn't compile. Uh, so it's just like in, in C Sharp, you have you know, lists of T. Uh, lists are also generic in, in Haskell. Now, lists in Haskell and, you know, in general in functional programming tend to be linked lists. So, um, so what a linked list is, that it's a, um, you know, it's a value, it, it contains a value which is on the head of the list, as we, as we call it. This is the value that we can see, and then there's a pointer to the rest of the list. So, um, so another way of writing, you know, first of all, you can write the empty list. The empty list just looks like this. But then what you can do is you can say, well, the, a list with one element is actually the element, the value one, and then a pointer to the rest of the list. 
uh, and the rest of the list might be the empty list, like this one. So this colon operator there is what we call the cons operator, and we sometimes say that we cons one onto the rest of the list. And the rest of the list we call the tail of the list. In this case, it's the empty list. So if, when I evaluate that, you will notice that it gives me just the syntactic sugar of that. Um, but that's basically those two things are completely equivalent. And you can, you know, you can cons things onto each other. So you can say, well, one, three, two, and then end them. As long as you end them with the empty list, uh, that's, that's going to be fine. Actually, you can also create infinite lists if you want to, but not with this syntax. Um, so you can see again, you know, the syntactic sugar version of that is just the, you know, the numbers one, three, and two. Now, this, is, is, this becomes important in just a moment. Um, the last thing I want to show you or talk about with lists is that we can also, you know, we're interested in, in, in looking at the numbers from 1 to 100, and we can use this thing called list comprehension. I'm just going to do the numbers from 1 to 15, and basically I'm just saying, well, you know, the start number, dot, dot, the end number, and then I'm just get a, going to get all of those numbers generated. So that's a little bit easier way of actually getting all the numbers from, you know, in, in a range. Now, remember this cons, um, you know, way of expressing things with, with the colon operator, because basically what I need to do now is I want to write a function where I say, well, if I have an input which is a list of numbers, I want to produce an output which is a list of strings, you know, where each element has been transformed into a string using that fisbus1 function. So I'll call this function fisbus, so that's why I didn't call the other one fisbus. And what I want to say is I want, I want the input to be a list of integers. And what I can do then is I can pattern match on that list you know, immediately and try to destructure the head and the tail. So I'll say, well, there's going to be a head. I'll, I'll call that i for integer. And then there's going to be the rest of the list, the tail of the list. And I'm going to call that i's. So that's the plural s. So it doesn't, it doesn't say is here, it says i, so read that as i's. This is very common in Haskell that you have things where it's called x and x's, or i and i's, or y and y's, or whatever. Um, so this is a fairly easy way of, of calling it. But basically it says, well, this is actually still one argument, but I am in, immediately, instead of trying to you know, pull the head and the tail out of the list, um, I'm just immediately doing this. So this is just a compact syntax for pulling the head of the tail out of the list immediately, even so it looks like it's, it's sort of two arguments but it's actually just one. So what I want to do is I want to say, well, okay, I want to take the number, I have one number, the i, that which is at the head of the list. I want to transform that using fisbus1. That's fairly easy. I just call fisbus1 with i, and then I want to say, well, that will be the head of my new list of strings, but I want to cons then onto another list of strings. So how do I get a list of strings from the rest of the integers? Well, I just cons that you know, to the rest of the in integers. So I'm just going to call, you know, recursively call fisbus with the i's. All right, so that's basically going to do almost all of it. The only thing that's, that's still missing here, and if I try to compile it, I actually get a warning. It says, well, there is a special case that you haven't dealt with because most lists tend to have this structure, but there is a special case of a list that doesn't have a head and a tail, and that is the empty list. So if the input is the empty list, this pattern actually doesn't match because there is not both a head and a tail. So I need to define, okay, what's going to happen in the case where the input is the empty list? I'm just going to say, all right, in that case, the output is also going to be the empty list. But because the compiler knows the types of these things, the input here is the em empty list of integers. The output is an empty list of strings. So even though we can't see the types, they're sort of still there. The compiler figures it out because it knows what I mean. So again, you know, if we, can, if we go back here and say, all right, let's reload all of this stuff, we can say, um, let's call fisbus with the numbers just from 1 to 15 and see what's going to happen. And we can see that, that we get, you know, 1, 2, fis, 4, bus, fis, 7, 8, and so on, you know, back. So that actually looks like it's working. What's the type of fisbus? So we can ask about that as well. The type is, it looks a lot like the other one. It's, it says, for all integral a, all show a, it's a list of a's that goes into a list of strings. So it's almost the other one, but it's just instead of one a going into one string, it's a list of a's that goes into a list of strings. Uh, so we can almost just take and copy and paste you know, this you know, type declaration up here, you know, paste it in here, you know, just remove a couple of things. I just need to put those square brackets around the, the, uh, the types here like this, and uh, this still ought to work. So, so this is the same. I just put the type declaration on because the compiler likes me to do this. So 
there is another warning here that, that, that I might uh, you know, be interested in here. And this is not from the compiler. This is from a linter. And it says, well, you know, this is something that is done. You, this you know, thing where you recursively call, you, know, you, you recursively move over a list and just call you know, a constant new list out of that until you, you reach the end of the list. That is such a common thing to do that it, that's actually built into the language. It's called a map. And it's not just Haskell. You know, it's in functional programming in general. This is just called a map. So why not, why not do that instead? So, um, so I just showed you this here because it shows you the general you know, way that you actually deal with things. So you also understand that the, the built-in map function is not magical in any way. It's actually implemented pretty much like this. Uh, but what, what it means, though, is we can say, well, we'll just define FISBUS to say, well, we'll take any uh, integers as input, any list of integers as input, and we'll just call map. And we'll say FISBUS1 is the function that we're going to use each, to map each element. And then we're just going to say that the other input to the map function is is, is those eyes, and that is ex exactly the same. And then, you know, Haskell wants me to do something, you know, or the linter wants me to do something called an eta reduce. Um, so this is almost like, this seems almost like, you know, mathematics, you know, like when you were solving, you know, uh, equations back in high school or college or whatever, uh, you can say, well, there's an eyes on both sides of the, uh, of the equal sign, so we can actually just remove those and, um, and say that is exactly equivalent again. So this is called point-free programming, and some people hate it, and some people People think it's really wonderful. I, I am sort of in, you know, torn in between that because it re I really like the feeling, you know, my brain gets every time I can do this, but then I come back to it and I say, this is completely unreadable. Um, so um, so I, I actually often tend not to do this, but, but, but the Haskell linter re really wants you to do this, but in F sharp I wouldn't do stuff like this. Um, but, you know, if we go and reload here, we can see that um, it still compiles, and if I do, um, you know, FISBUS from 1 to 15, it still returns exactly the same. So it's just a simpler implementation, if you will. Now, we're not quite there yet because we're actually not... You know, the, the specification of the problem says that we have to print the numbers from 1 to 100. I'm actually not printing anything yet. And, and you'd probably argue, well, but you are because the things are just there. Well, yes, but that is because the REPL, you know, the read eval print loop prints it for me. So I'm just toying around in this development environment called read eval print loops that reads the expression that I write. You know, evaluate it and then prints the result of that expression and then gives me, you know, prompt so that I can write a new express expression. But that's actually not, you know, if I run my program, it doesn't print anything. Actually, still, you know, my main method still just prints hello world because I haven't done anything else. So I'll need to just, uh, you know, print this. And I also, you know, instead of having just this list, you know, printing from left to right, I want to have, you know, printing a column where with each um, value on a new line. So there's a couple of things that I still need to do. So you might say, well, okay, instead of having put strln uh, hello world here, can I just put in, you know, uh, fisbus and then, you know, 1 to 15? Would that work? And, and that turns out not to work because I have declared, uh, you know, my main entry point to be of the type IO of unit. And that means uh, that, it's a that it's a function that takes no, no input, it returns no output, but it has side effects. And the side effect is that it prints to the console. And uh, FISBUS 1 to 15 doesn't have a side effect, it actually returns a string. So these types are actually incompatible. So what I'd m much rather like to do is I want to say, well, I have a list of strings. I want to concatenate all of those strings together to become a single string, but where each of the elements are separated with a new line character, and then I want to print those. Uh, the, most of this is basically just built into Haskell, so that's, that's fairly easy to do. So, so the function that uh, you know, takes a list of strings and just creates a single string with new lines is actually built in. It's called unlines, but that just returns a single string. That's still not IO of, of uh, unit, but then I can say, all right, so I'll just call uh, put str, and, um, and then that's going to work. So I'll, I'll get back to this in a moment, but let's just see if we reload this and I call the main function again. Um, oh, that's just 1 to 15. I should actually do you know, 1 to 100. Uh, so reload and uh, main again, and you'll see that it prints all the numbers. Uh, so that's very nice. So normally when there is a demo and it succeeds, you clap. <laughs> Oh, I know. It's yay! <laughs> I know that's that wasn't actually particularly, you know, difficult. So, all right. So one of the things that is a little bit funny about Haskell is that uh, you know uh, functions are actually composed right to left. So, so what actually happens here is we say, well, we'll start with the function call where we call fisbus with one to one hundred. 
Then we take the value of that and call the online functions with that one. The output of that one will then take that value and call put str with that value, and that's the string that, that you then saw was printed. So that's sort of a backwards, and exactly why Haskell has that backwards composition, I don't actually know. It's a little bit weird. Um, it's not the most readable. It's one of the things about the language that, you know, not my favorite part, um, but uh, well, there, there are ways around it, so, uh, well, you know, in, in practice, it's not that big a deal. All right, so that's just a glimpse into Haskell, and, and if you're left with lots of questions, that's fine, um, but in the interest of time, let's just move on to Clojure. So, um, so what, we, what can we say about Clojure? So first of all, we can say that Clojure also has a nice logo, so that must obviously mean that it's a nice language. And um, it's also a dynamically typed language. So Haskell, as we looked at, was statically typed. The type system of Haskell is extremely powerful. It's much more powerful than C-Sharp or Java's type system. Now, Clojure is in the completely different end of the spectrum because it's dynamically typed. So that's interesting just uh, you know, to contrast the other thing. Um, it's also what we call a functional first language. So Clojure runs on the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, and just like if Sharp is a multi paradigmatic language because it needs to run on .NET and interoperate with things written in C Sharp or in Visual Basic, well, Clojure runs on the JVM, so it needs to interoperate with all the object-oriented code written in Java, uh, and therefore you know, it can do object-oriented things as well. So you don't have to be functional, but it's, it's designed to make functional programming easy. Um, so it's, it's sort of like the, its first you know, priority is to make functional programming easy, and then you can also do imperative of, of you know, object-oriented code with it. Uh, the third thing that you may also already have sort of gotten the hint is that it's a lisp. So uh, just like in Haskell, I showed you a list of strings that were you know, a proper Haskell code. This is actually proper you know, closure code there. Um, so closure is a value that uh, contains those uh, three uh, strings. So uh, at runtimes, obviously, it's a, it's, a lay, it's a list of strings, but you know, at compile time, well, there is no compile time, so it's just being interpreted as, as we go along. So, um, so let's look at what that would look like. So I'll switch to another editor, and uh, you, as you can tell, first of all, there are some errors there in the output. I'm not going to use that console a whole lot. It's just I just have that console sitting there, you know, because towards the end I want to print all the numbers. Um, but this particular editor sometimes complains about things, and you will see those um, pink uh, error messages there in the console. You just ignore them for now. You know, it, it just makes the demo more colorful because now you also have pink on the screen, um, so that's nice. But otherwise, it doesn't really mean anything. Hopefully. Um, so um, I can type things over here on the left-hand side, and this is where I'm going to type my closure code. So the first thing we might say, well, you know, what does a function call look like? So in Haskell, we could, you know, write something like show one in order to um, to convert the number one into a string. Now, as you can tell, that does not work in closure. Now, in, in other languages, uh, you, you may have to say, well, your argument should be enclosed in brackets like this one. Um, that's, you know, the fairly, you know, normal syntax and pretty remini reminiscent of, you know, how, how C Sharp works or Java works or whatever. Um, that's not the closure syntax uh, either, but it's, we're getting closer because we actually need the brackets. We just need to move the bracket over here, and then, you know, the function to turn things into strings in closure is not called show. It's called str or string, I suppose. And then now you can see that I have, the, you know, the number one, you know, converted into a string. And if I, you know, use three, uh, that number is con converted into the string three. So that's basically what a function call looks like. So it's not, you know, one of the common things that people have against lisps are that, you know, there are all these brackets. But what we often find is that there are just as many brackets in C sharp. They're just placed in different, you know, it's just put in different places, but there's actually not necessarily more brackets. There probably are more brackets with closure, but it's just you know, syntactical. We don't have to worry about it. And as I you know, warned you, it just you know, dumps out all of these things because the internet uh, connection is rubbish, but um, I don't think it's actually going to affect us anyway. So the next thing we could say, well, we need to define a function called fisbus. How do we define a function? Well, that's pretty easy. We just write diffun, and uh, we call the function fisbus. And it's going to take some arguments. So we'll say, well, the, um, the function is going to take a single argument. We can call that i. And um, then the, um, the body of the function is just that we call str on i. 
So uh, that means that I can call FizzBuzz now with the number one, for example, and that if, uh, with the number one, and that evaluates to the string one. So that's, that's uh, fantastic. And uh, if we try to call it with the number two, it evaluates to two, now, and three, it evaluates to three. That ought to be Fizz, but it's three at the moment. So I'll just type out the other ones that I actually care about, five and uh, you know, 15. They all just evaluate to the number at the moment, and I want them to evaluate to you know, Fizz and Bus and Fizz Bus and so on. So, but that's just to get us started. So you, now you can see we already have a function. So the first thing we might say is, okay, so how do we actually make the decision between, or how do we switch between you know, the case where we should write fist bus and the case where we should write bus and so on. So in Haskell you saw that I used uh, you know, sort of like um, constrained functions with Boolean expressions in each function definition. Uh, that's not how closure works. Uh, so we need to figure out whether we have something that is closer to like in C sharp. We had, you know, if, else, if, else, if, else. Do we have that in closure? And we do. It's called cond uh, for condition, I suppose. And uh, basically the structure of this is that um, you, you provide pairs of Boolean expressions and return values. So basically what you say, I'm just going to hard code a Boolean expression. For now, I'm just going to say true. And then I'm going to say, well, uh, fistbus. And then you know there's a new pair of a Boolean expression and a return value, and I'm going to say bus here. I'm going to change the hard-coded you know uh, Boolean expressions later on, and then I say true fizz. And then you know there's an else branch. If not, none of these are true, I can say else, and then I just return you know some number. Right now I'm just going to hard-code one. So you can see this entire expression at the moment just returns fizzbuzz because the first expression up here, the first Boolean expression up here is true. Right now it's hard-coded. So what's in all those other things here actually doesn't matter. Uh, you know, if I, um, if I type false here, the result is still fizzbuzz. Um, but you know, if I change this to false, obviously it now evaluates to fizz because it just falls back, you know, down into the first true that it can find, you know, and, and you know, it's probably not surprising, but if they're all false, it, we return the else value, and that is one. So that's sort of the structure that I'm looking for. And um, I'll just cut that, and I'll replace the current function, function body that I have with this structure. And I'm just going to say, well, instead of you know, returning the hard code of string one, I'm just going to have to remember to still return str of i. So the, the behavior didn't change. I actually didn't get any further, but now I have sort of the template for where I need to go. So the next thing I need to figure out is to, instead of just hard coding an expression here, how do I actually determine if a, you know, a number is a multiple of, of three, for example, down here? Well, just like I did with the other, in the other examples, I, I need to do some sort of modulo comparison. So I can say, well, mod three of three, for example, that is actually zero. You know, mod six of three is also zero, but mod five of three is two, for example. So that's not quite a Boolean expression. What I really want, what I really need that you know, modular operation to be is I need it to be zero. So I need to compare, is that expression, is it zero or not? So how do I compare something, uh, two values, and figure out whether they're equal? Well, I used a function that yeah, is used to determine whether these two are equal. And that function is called the equal sign. So I just say, well, I'll just take those two values and try to compare them to each other. So again, you will notice, just like everything else in Clojure, the function is the first element in the list. And that is what, what's being you know, evaluated. And all the other elements in the list are just arguments to that function. And some functions can take an arbitrary number of arguments. This one can, for example. So I can say, you know, I can put as many zeros I, as I want here, and they are all equal to each other. But you know, if I just you know, put one, uh, one here, uh, that actually turns out to be, you know, I should probably put, you know, in order to demonstrate that, I should just probably change this to six. So you can see they're all zero, that evaluates to true. You know, if I change one of them to be not a zero, that evaluates to false then. But that's, that's a, you know, a, a ridiculous thing to do in this case. Uh, so let's just go back here and say, this is actually the sort of thing that we're, that we're looking for. You know, is it, is, is it equal to zero? So I'll cut that and I'll paste it in up here and I'll say, well, I'll just replace that hard-coded five with an I and, um, now we can see that fizzbus3 returns fizz, 
And FISBUS of five doesn't return you know, bus yet because I haven't done that. FISBUS of 15 also returns FIS because you know, 15 is a multiple of three. That's also wrong, but uh, we can fix that fairly easily. So the next thing we can say is, okay, let's just replace the other ones here. That one is just you know, a replace and, and changing the, uh, the number. And uh, then up here, we can say something like, well, um, the easiest thing is probably to say, well, what, you know, I could write 15 here, and that would actually solve the problem. But again, you know, I, I don't want to think too much about the, 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 um, the constant 15, so I'd, I'd much rather do this. And I think that is a little bit closer to the problem description. So something like, something, something like that um, is, uh, is something that I'm happy with. So um, I'm not going to spend more time with that anyway, so let's move on. So again, just like I had in Haskell, I now have a function that you know, can take a single integer and turn it into a string. Now I want to figure out, okay, so what if I have, you know, I, what, how do I print all the numbers from 1 to 100? And it turns out exactly the same thing, you know, the same principle that applies it to Haskell, we can also apply it here. But in, um, in Clojure, we can actually do function overloading, which we couldn't in Haskell. And um, the way that we fu do function overloading is that we say, well, we'll put uh, each of the arguments um, the, and group uh, the function you know, according to arguments. So we can say, right now, this is just a way of, of grouping things a little bit differently. So since Clojure is a dynamic language, we can't overload on the input type because you know, things don't have type uh, as such. Um, but we can overload on the number of arguments, and this is what's called the function's arity. That's just a f fancy way of saying number of arguments. So this uh, overload here has an arity of one because it takes one argument. So what I want now is to say, well, let's define another function that has an arity of two. It's going to take a start and an end, and uh, then it's going to, you know, I, I'm just going to put in a placeholder string here. Um, so that I can call it, and then we'll start to figure out, okay, how do we actually replace that? Um, so this function here, this is the same function, it's still a FISBUS function, but this is the, the overload that has arity too. So that means I should be able to call it with, uh, you know, like 1 to 16, for example, and right now it just returns the string placeholder because that's what I put there. So you could say, well, okay, so how do I get the numbers from start to end? Well, you know, we had list comprehension in Haskell, so, uh, you know, in Haskell I could just write something like, you know, 1 dot dot, you know, 15. That is not a syntax that is, uh, you, know, val you know, valid in, in Clojure, um, but we have a function called range where we can just pass in start and end, and uh, that now gives me the numbers from 1 to, uh, to 15. So you'll notice that end is exclusive. You know, in Haskell, 1 to 15 meant all the numbers, you know, 1 and 15, uh, but uh, this range function uh, excludes the end. So that's why I need to say from 1 to 16, that gives me actually the numbers 1 up till uh, 15, but not 16. Um, I'm not too happy about this uh, yet because it's just returning the numbers. I want to convert them into strings. Um, and that's just as trivial to, as to do in, in Haskell because map is a functional concept. So we also have a built-in map function here. And I'm just going to say, well, use the FISBUS function and uh, it'll figure out that it actually needs to use the version with the different arity. So it, it'll know that it needs to use the, the overload of FISBUS that has arity 1. And that is why now it's printing 1, 2, FIS, 4, BUS, FIS, and so on. So that's fine, but we're not really, I'm not quite happy with this yet because you'll notice that the overload that takes one argument returns a string, whereas the overload that takes two arguments returns a list of strings. And I think, you know, a function that has various different overloads but returns different, you know, different types, that's sort of confusing. That is not good API design. So I want this to return a string also. Specifically, I want, to return, want it to return a string that just concatenated all of those things together, but with a new line, you know, character between each of them. So in, uh, in Haskell, we could call a function that simply ju just takes a list of strings and then just concatenates all of those in together in one string. That was the built-in function unlines. Um, in, in, in Clojure, we also have a function that does that, but it's buried you know, within some namespace that we'd ne then need to open. So instead of, of doing that, let's just see if we can build it from, from first principles, if we will, because there are built-in things here in the call on the root namespace that actually enable us to do that. So there is a, a function called interpose uh, that can do uh, just that. And basically, it just says, well, which, which value do you want to interpose with? And uh, then we can just say, well, OK, I want to interpose with the new line character so, or the new line string. So now we can see I have you know, the string 1, the string new line, the string 2, the string new line, the string fist. So they're still not concatenated, but now I have the new line you know, string in between all the other values. So I'm closer to where I want to be. And uh, you know, it might be more readable uh, closure code if we actually you know, wrap things around a little bit. I don't know. Um, 
So we need to figure out, okay, how do we actually concatenate the strings? This is basically the last thing we need to do. So um, it turns out that that str function there actually also does that. So, you know, just as an example, you know, if I have list of foo and bar and, and bass, you know, um, it just gives me foo bar bass. You know, and, and again, you know, the number of arguments is, it can be any number of arguments. So if I, you know, add cukes there, and, you know, this, it just concatenates all of those things together. So it can be, you know, any arbitrary number of arguments, it's just gonna concatenate all of those strings together. So that seems promising. Let's try to do that. So we'll say, okay, so um, I'll just write str here, and then I'll make sure to put a bracket at the end. And then we'll see, you know, down here in the evalu evaluation, it says, well, it doesn't do what we expected because it just returns the string closure.lang.lazy.sick at <laughs> number. Um, and that's not really what we wanted. And the reason for that is it turns out that, you know, that expression, all of this expression here, is exactly of that type. It's a lazy sequence. It's actually not yet a number, uh, you know, a list of numbers uh, or a list of strings. It's only a list of strings once you start enumerating, uh, enumerating them. And, you know, a, a list of values is not the same thing as an argument list uh, that you use, you know, that you, you know, put specifically into a, a function call, if you will. So this doesn't quite work. But on the other hand, this is such a common thing that you'd need to do in Crozier that ob obviously there's a solution for that. So basically, every time you need to, to say, well, you know, I want to call a function, for example, str, and I have a list of something, and I just want you to treat that as the input list, as the argument list to this function. Well, there's another built-in function that's called apply that basically just enables you to do that. Um, so just say, well, apply str to this, you know, input list, and then it does what it is that we need to do. So now you'll see, you know, down there at that, um, you know, fistbus from 1 to 16 actually returns a single string with all of this uh, new line stuff in it. So I just want to do uh, two things because first of all, you know, the requirements are actually that I should um, that I should return the um, the numbers from one to one hundred. So again, you know, I'm just going to do a placeholder here, and I, so I'm now defining an, an overload with an arity of one or uh, of an, with an arity of zero, and that means I can call fistbus without you know supplying any arguments at all. And right now it's just going to return placeholder because that's what I wrote up there. But obviously what I want to do instead is I want to hard code, if you will, the numbers from one to one hundred. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call fistbus with the um, with the numbers from one to one hundred. And since uh, you know the the end is exclusive, I need to do one to one hundred and one. So, so that's fistbus without any arguments. Um, the only thing that we've left now is just like in Haskell, we might need to do you know, a, 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 main, a main function, you know, the entry point into an application that would actually print all of this stuff out there on the console. Um, I'm not going to do that, so I'm just going you know, I'm to I'm not going to create a program for this. I'm just going to print it out here. So let's just see if we can clear the console. Um, that there all this uh, pink stuff uh, went array. So we can say um, print. I'm just going to call fistbus. Bang, and there we have all the, the stuff again. All right, so that's the Fistbus uh, Carter in, in, um, in Closure as well. Very nice. Yay! Thank you. All right, so let's go back and see, did we learn anything? And uh, what, of, what often happens to me when I do, when I do Carters is that it turns out that um, maybe not every time, but the, by doing exercises and learning new languages and doing you know, Carters and so on, it changes the way that I think about things, or it gives me more options for modeling how to address various problems. And it turns out that often what you can do is you can backport what you learned from one language or one technique into what you do on, in your day-to-day -day job. And we can do that here as well. And there's nothing new in this in the sense that, you know, a lot of the features that you have in C Sharp and in Java now are things that are actually backported from other languages and so on. Um, but let's just see what it looks like here. So here's a new version of the C Sharp um, implementation of the Carter. So you'll notice that the entry point now is a main method. And the only thing it does is it says, well, console the right line. Um, the value of calling fistbus from 1 to 100. And so that looks a lot uh, similar to what I did in Haskell and Clojure. I'm just, you know, the main, the entry point is just a call to something that produces a string, and then I print that string. Now, what is fistbus? Well, it's a, it's a helper method here that uh, takes and starts an account. And basically, you see the first uh, line there says enumerable range from start to count. So enumerable.range is built into C Sharp. I think it's part of the link namespace somewhere. 
Um, so that's just a static Hilbert method that will produce an I enumerable of int from start and then with count. So the API is a little bit different. You don't you know, supply an int value. You, you, know, you, know, you tell it how many elements you want. Um, so in this case, it's, it's the same one to one, uh, and, and the number of elements you want is 100. So that's pretty much the same. So that gives you an I enumerable of int. And then you can say, well, let's do a select over that. And select is just the C-sharp name for a map. So you saw map in both Haskell and Clojure. And, that, and map is what it's called in functional programming. But um, you know, when Anas Heitzberg um, decided to, to, do, and, uh, you know, to implement link, you know, language integrated query in, uh, in C-sharp, he thought that it would be easier for C-sharp and, and Visual Basic developers to learn if the concepts were named not from functional programming, but from uh, SQL syntax. Uh, because most uh, you know, C-sharp developers were probably familiar with uh, you know, working with SQL Server, Oracle, or whatever at the time. Um, so se a select in SQL is basically the same thing as a map anyway, uh, or whatever. It's pretty closely related. So there's, I'm not saying the name is bad, but that's just why he chose to, to name it like that instead of calling it map. But it is exactly the same thing. And then what we, give, uh, what we get back there is then an I enumerable of string, and then we can aggregate it. So we, you know, we saw the aggregation before. You know, in Clojure, I had this interpose thing. Um, what I'm doing here is uh, I just supply a little lambda expression, and I'm saying, well, for any two x and y, those are two strings. I'm just going to concatenate those together, but also put a new line in between them. And then that's going to create a new string, which becomes a new x, and then I get a new y from the next element of the list, and then I can concatenate those together. And that just becomes one string in the end. And uh, the FISPOS1 helper method is not surprising. It just looks like this. It takes a single integer and returns a string. Now, one of the things that are interesting in, in, with this is, well, first of all, you might ask, is this better than the previous, um, the previous implementation in C-sharp? This is actually a little longer. The, the last one was like 10 lines of actual code. This is maybe 12, 15 lines of code. Uh, so uh, do, do we think it's better? Maybe not. You know, it's always subjective uh, because it depends on what your needs are. But one thing that I think is interesting about this is if you imagine that you took those two helper functions, you know, FISPOS and FISPOS1, and made them public, these functions would, or methods would actually be very testable because these are actually what we, what we know as pure functions. I talked about pure functions yesterday in my talk yesterday. And uh, one of the things that I talked about, well, is if a function is a pure function, you know, it's deterministic, has no side effects, it's trivial to unit test. This is very, very easy to unit test. So if you have a need of unit testing something, you know, instead of going and trying to you know, introduce all sorts of interfaces and say, well, I need an interface that, uh, that emulates that I'm writing to the console, and then I need to mock that interface and blah, 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 which a lot of people would actually do if they needed to make this testable. Well, what we can say is, well, you know, now we have FISBUS1, and we have FISBUS, and these are two pure functions, so they're trivial to unit test. And then what we have left is just the main um, the main function or the main method there. And the question is, that's basically just a declarative one-liner. Do we really need to unit test that? There's no logic in it, so probably not. We can leave that as what Gerard Massaras calls a humble method and not test it. And then we could test all the other things. So I think it's often interesting to, to see, you know, you actually get some benefit out of learning how to do it in different languages or in different paradigms. And that might actually be applicable when you bring it back home. So. Um, so if you, if you thought this was interesting or it piqued your interest, uh, interest then um, you're welcome to come and ask me. I think I have like two minutes left, so I'm not going to take any you know, answers, uh, questions and answers now. Um, but just come up and ask me afterwards, and I'll be happy, happy to talk to you. Um, if you. If you thought this was interesting, I have a, sometimes I blog a little bit about my adventures in Carter, so you can you know, subscribe to the blog or to Twitter. Um, also, I, I do occasionally cover some of these things. The Diamond Carter, for example, I do a treatment of the Diamond Carter with property-based testing in one of my Pluralsight courses. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can go to bit.ly slash Pluralsight, because i you know, sometimes known as, as Plur. And that's all the link to all my courses. If you don't have a subscription to Pluralsight, I have, um, I have vouchers here that you can welcome to come and get. This is a, um, this is a free one month subscription to, um, to Pluralsight, it's a trial subscription. So if you want those, then come and get them. And also, if you want to ask me something, come and ask me. Meet me out in the hallway. If you see me later on today, then ask me. I'll be happy to talk to you. But with that, I'll um, you know, let you go if you, if you want to you know, go and do something else. So thank you for coming.